You're at the Coaching Inn, 3D Coaching's virtual pub where we enjoy conversations with people who are engaged in the world of coaching. Hello and welcome to this week's Coaching Inn. I'm Claire Pedrick and today I'm in conversation with Duncan Partridge who's just written a book about coaching and education. But let's talk about the book later, Duncan. Tell us about you. So, hey, thank you for having me. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, Pleasure. So me, I am, well, let me start with my, my family life. I'm a father of uh, two boys. Um, I live in London um, and I have had a long career that's taken me in all sorts of different directions. Uh, and as I come towards the end of my um, working time, I, I found myself in, in coaching. And um, I, I think that... Um, it's one of those stories where all sorts of um, incidents uh, and signs have pointed me um, in, in in this direction. So I started off as a as a, as a primary teacher in um, in central London, um, and um, when I got married in the mid nineties, uh, my wife, who's also a teacher, uh, and I decided to embark on um, an international adventure, and we worked in various international schools around the world um, in countries ranging from Lesotho in Southern Africa to Peru and Argentina in South America and then more latterly uh, Italy Um, and during that time um, I became a senior leader and and then a head uh, and really enjoyed working in uh, that diverse range of places in very different types of schools with very different types of situations uh, and during all that time, um, kind of came across um, coaching as it began to surface as uh, a, a, an area um, of um, professional development and um, and became sort of interested in it, but never really found out much about it. Uh, and then on returning to the UK in um, around about 2012, um we I, I i kind of investigated a little bit further and, and realized that i'd be missing out on something realized that um i could have done with knowing a lot more about coaching when i was a senior leader uh, and uh, and ahead um both in terms of how i interacted with my teams but also in terms of how i sought support in terms of moving forward uh, with my own sort of um challenges and goals etc um so so retrained just um three and a half years ago um now uh, as as a coach uh, and since then I've found myself um involved in a range of really interesting um coaching related projects most of which center around schools and education um and that's continued to to take me around the world which is which is wonderful um so yeah that's that's where I am now a potted history of of how I became interested and got involved in coaching so you said there were little things. Yeah. So tell us some of those little so, things. So two, two, uh, two sort of little stories spring immediately to mind. Um, so one was when I was um, a head teacher, um, and um, I, I, I became a head teacher relatively at a relatively young age. I was in my my mid thirties. Um, and as is often the case when people sort of um, rise into positions of seniority, I suppose no matter what what age you are, it continues uh, on an ongoing basis. But the, I, I felt that classic imposter syndrome um, feeling, uh, thinking, goodness me, what am I doing in this in this position in this situation? And um, my response to that imposter syndrome was to try and take on the uh, hero head persona I would describe it as um I will be um the rock for everybody I will be infallible um I will be the problem solver um and for all sorts of reasons which we which we I'm sure that everybody's aware of that's not a sustainable position to take uh it's not good for the individual uh, but it's also not very good for other people around you as well um, so I recognised two things. Firstly, that um, I um, needed some support myself in order to have thinking space to um, to try and sort of resolve challenges, uh, work towards goals. But I also recognised that the way I was working with my teams 
uh, was not um, was not the best way. And this is all retrospective. <laughs> I didn't realize that at the time. It was only when I sort of delved into coaching more. So, you know, there's there's an element of, uh, I suppose, regret about how I sort of responded to certain situations and dealt with certain situations. I mean, you know, there's never any, no ill will involved. Um, I, I, I felt at the time I was um doing the best I could for for myself and uh, and the team around me but but retrospectively realized that had I taken a, a different approach and a more sort of coaching approach and allowed myself to be coached then you know then I then I think the, you know the outcomes uh, might have been even better so that's one kind of situation that 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 um I think of and then the other is back when I was a when I was a teacher um and one of the elements of um, coaching that, that I'm involved in now is is a very sort of um, school specific um, coaching approach, which is around um, using a coaching approach to help teachers get better at what they do in the classroom. So to improve their their classroom practice, instructional coaching, it's often called. Uh, and I remember um, sort of two years into my career, um, feeling that I was getting to grips with this um, challenging business of teaching. Um, and indeed, all the feedback I'd been receiving during those first two years was was quite positive. Uh, and then a new head teacher came into the school and uh, came and observed a couple of my classes and gave me some feedback, which which wasn't very positive. Um, she expressed concern about my my sort of classroom management and uh, some of the behaviour in the class, which was all kind of new to me. And um, my initial response was quite defensive, I suppose. Um, well, who are you to come in here and tell me that I'm not doing my job well when I've got two years? of experience on belt and uh, had a completely different experience um uh but she sort of said right well what i suggest you do is here's a couple of books read these books um and go and see uh ms a in this classroom over there and mr b in that classroom over there they do it really really well go and go and learn from them so i kind of flicked through the books and there was some interesting stuff in there and i went to go and see these these two teachers and uh, I remember um, A, being massively impressed by what they were doing and thinking, goodness me, how do they create this magical atmosphere? Um, what are they actually doing? And, and B, being completely overwhelmed, but by not really knowing where to start with what I was experiencing. There was, you know, they, they didn't seem to be doing anything in particular. Obviously, they were using certain strategies, but there isn't wasn't any sort of one thing that I could pick up on um, and and I went away and all it really did was have the imp- impact of making me feel worse about myself than I was before um, because I compared myself with them and I didn't really know what to take away from the experience of having having observed them. So um, instructional coaching um, allows um, teachers to focus in on particular areas of their practice in a way that they feel in control of um, and in a way that allows them not to feel overwhelmed by the number of a number of different things that they're focusing on at one time. They're homing in on one sort of area of um, high leverage practice, it's often called, and 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 using the support of a coach, of an instructional coach, to put this into practice, develop it, pra- uh, uh, um, try and make it ha- habitual, uh, and then move on to something else. And again, I recognise now, um, that I would have really benefited from that approach at that time, rather than this head teacher saying, go and watch a couple of teachers, read a couple of books and do it, get better. I had no real pathway to get better. I didn't yeah. have somebody with me to help map out that pathway. Yeah, it's in, uh, so many things coming into my mind as you're speaking, Duncan, because when you were talking about the head being a head teacher, the hero head. Yeah. I was thinking, actually, we have a lot of hero coaches. Mm. That's, yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. And I think that, that you know, I, I, and, you know, I sometimes have to um, resist the ten, the, a, a tendency to sort of try and fulfill that role myself, because, yeah. you know, historically, that's what I'd always done. So, you know, you get into these habits of mind and that that that, that particular habit of mind is, is still there and it would be easy for me to fall back into it. So I have to um monitor myself very closely to make sure that I'm not moving into that you know that I am here as a a a partner uh, a thinking partner for somebody and not somebody who's there to to offer solutions and uh, and pathways I mean you know that I do tend to feel um I'm I'm not a I suppose um purist coach and I do think that sometimes there are moments when offering um and I put emphasis on that word offering um, a suggestion is 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 appropriate. 
but as Bungostania says, you know, that shouldn't be your default. Uh, you know, you should make sure that the, 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 the advice monster is tamed and that um, yeah. that is some way down the line. <laughs> you need to read my next book, Duncan. <laughs> ah, is that, is that whole... your, one of your focuses there? One of the things is around the uh, around offer. So yeah. um, I had Catherine Mannix on the podcast a few weeks ago, and she's got this beautiful line in her book, Listen, where mm. she says, we offer and they choose. Mm. Yeah, like but that. most coaches think they're offering, mm-hmm. but they're actually, it sounds like a statement. Yeah, yeah. And in yeah. Off, if an offer sounds like a statement, even if it would look like an offer, if you wrote it down, it's still yeah. not an offer. Absolutely. So the sound of the offer is really yeah. important. Absolutely. And, and you know, you just have to be, even if you're very, very careful with the words you choose, you also obviously have to be very, very cognizant of, of how they're landing as well. Because even if, you know, you, you, you've tried very, to, very carefully to make sure that the, that the language you're using uh, is, is, is correct and appropriate, the way it's received and perceived isn't necessarily the same i mean i like i like um when david clutterbuck talks about um powerful questions one of the one of the, the features being that they are innocent and that's another i think um potential issue with 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 coaches um using questioning sometimes in that they can actually use questioning in and this is a strong word um a, a manipulative fashion in a way that sort of um leads coaches down a road that the coach already has in their head so they're using the, the the questions to kind of guide them in a way that they think that they need to go rather than using them in an innocent way which is purely a a, a, a sort of a a a, a a way of facilitating joint inquiry rather than I'm going to use my questions in a clever way to kind of guide you down the path that I think you need to go down. <laughs> I had, um, uh, I recently had a, pri- a former primary school teacher in a, in a coaching refresher program that I was running in an organization. And at the beginning, so we did two sessions and at the end of session one, he said, um, it's interesting because I was a primary school teacher and I realized that I've left a lot of the good stuff that I knew from that at the door. And I need to integrate some of that into the way that I work here in this workplace. And at the end of session two, he said, I've got to ask questions in a completely different way. Because when I'm asking questions at school, mm. it's because I want them to come up with an appropriate answer. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And coaching isn't about that, is it? That's right. Which is what you've just said. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a lot of I, I, I'm kind of outside my my um, interest and focus on coaching the education world. I'm sort of uh, I, I keep a weather eye on and I'm very interested in sort of developments and thinking about what works in the classroom and and, and pedagogy and uh, and questioning is is always comes up as being one of the key tools of a teacher. And as you say, I mean, there there, there are moments where um, trying to guide the students towards a correct answer is is a good use of questioning. But um, I'm a, I, I'm very interested in the whole idea of dialogic teaching, which is where a teacher uses questions to guide joint inquiry within the class. Really, so so um, you know, they're, they're, the questions are used as thinking prompts for for students who then respond to that and take the um, take take the, the, the their joint thinking forward, thinking together. It's often called. So there's some some great work out there, Neil. Mer- uh, who's a who's a Cambridge um, professor uh, of education has done written some brilliant books on on dialogic classrooms and how they can be really powerful educational experiences for for students. Mm. Creating a thinking space because that's all we're doing, right? Exactly, exactly that. I mean, that's 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 in a nutshell. That's what coaching is. It's creating a a space for for thinking that is that is going to be useful for for the person going forward. Yeah. So if you'd had your coaching training Mm. and your insight into coaching and that kind of coaching being when you've been a teacher, what are two or three things that would have been different? (sighs) Well, I think, I mean, I can think of my, you know, my time in the classroom and I can think of my time in, 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 in leadership. I mean, I think that, that focusing on the latter first, um, within my leadership role, I can think of um, a number of situations where um, I, I, okay, here's an example. Um, We, this was in Argentina. um, And um, one of the things that I picked up on quite early in the school that I was working in is that there was um, 
for all sorts of reasons, something of a sort of a a, 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 a culture of um, th- th- there was quite a lot of bullying that happened within the school. Um, and um, at that time, within Argentina, um, the schooling and the school system hadn't really sort of picked up on this concept of of bullying uh, and it being a problematic experience for for children um uh to the extent that there was no spanish word for bullying um huh? so so we kind of um created what bulliando um or sometimes we just used bullying because it was a it was a bilingual school um but you know one of the first things that 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 needed to be done was to um to, to create this understanding of what bullying is and and why it is a problem and i my my instinct was to kind of be very proactive in telling people what bullying was in um creating a series uh, of sort of systems and responses to bullying i would sort of lead uh, assemblies um i would talk to my teams i would talk to to students as well to try and a develop awareness of bullying and b try and help put in place a system that responded to it and 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 and, and hopefully reduce the reduce the problem um and i recognize retrospectively that that had i taken a more coaching approach to that and actually got people to think about um why bullying was a problem and asking them questions about maybe their own experiences of it and their own ideas for responding to this, then um, there might have been a um, a more impactful response. We might have um, grappled with the problem and come up with some solutions more quickly than we did. And we did in the end, but I think that it took some time for me to, for the school to, to, um be able to come up with solutions because I was being too uh, too proactive I wasn't being coaching enough in my approach yeah. to engaging with the various members of the community um yeah so I think that's just that's just one example and I think you know that again is was me being the hero head there's me saying, yes. you know, I'm gonna charge in on my on my 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 trusty steed and sort out this problem that you didn't know you had but I've seen it uh, and I'm gonna take you all into the sunlit uplands and you know everything will be will be all right and that's a bit of an exaggeration but you know that that, that, that you, you could sort of describe uh, it, it that way and looking back at it res- retrospectively you know whereas had I engaged with the community and um helped this 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 joint inquiry and i'm aware that i'm using those two words quite quite regularly in our in our chat at the moment but i think they're important had, had we done that then you know then maybe there would have been greater ownership of the um the, the the solution to the problem exactly and you've you've described again another kind of hiccup that we can experience in coaching that that when you were the head, you were doing too much work and taking mm. too much responsibility. Mm. But the simple maths of that mm-hmm. is when you're doing a lot, taking a lot of responsibility and doing a lot of work, pe- other people aren't. Yes, because they can't <laughs> because you've take you've taken it. Yeah, and then exactly. you go, why are they not doing this? Exactly. But actually, that also happens, doesn't it? Even inside the coaching conversation, where the coach takes too much. Yeah. Um, but what a beautiful example of where coaching would have made a difference. <laughs> so your book, we can me- let's mention your book, Coaching for Educators, How to Transform CPD in Your School. Mm. So what are the hopes that you have for the transformation of CPD from your book? Well, I think that um, within the schooling world and in the world of education there 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 there's a lot of um thought currently being um given to um to professional development and and how can we as a collective profession um continuously improve what we're doing um and um the traditional um response to that question has been attend a course do a workshop read some books, all of which are good, you know, they, they're great. Um, but all of which tend to have limited impact on what people are doing on their day-to-day basis um, in their classrooms and in their offices around schools. Uh, and what tends to happen is they'll go on this very inspiring conference and listen to um, some wonderful speakers 
who fire people up with all sorts of ideas. Uh, and then they'll be back in the classroom on Monday, the day after, and it will have gone out of the window. Um, and, you know, despite having fantastically good intentions uh, at the end of the experience, it's just the reality of school life is such that um, cognitively um, it, your your energies are being completely consumed by the day-to-day -day reality of what you're doing. So what coaching offers as an alternative is a way of, yes, attending these conferences, attending these workshops, but then um, providing a space for actually reflecting on what does this mean for me? What can I take away from the article I've read, the workshop that I've attended, the lecture that I've listened to? Uh, and what can I do with this in a very real, tangible way within my particular context? Um, and um, through that process of being coached, teachers, leaders, whatever position um, somebody has in a school, have the opportunity to, um, with their thinking partner, make these plans that are based on their priorities, their reality, um, what's going on for them at the time. It's a, a bespoke approach to professional development, really. So, you know, I like to think of the idea of, yes, it's important to have this input, but then you need to have a way of being able to sift through that input in order to find the stuff that's really going to work for you. And then uh, I, I'm, a, I, I'm very interested in um, what uh, the links between um, what we know about how our brains work and um, and coaching. And I think what coaching does is it provides um, an opportunity for uh, teachers, anybody really, to manage their cognitive load. Um, one of the problems that we have is that we are we are we're bombarded by information, by stimuli, uh, and what coaching does is it just provides an opportunity to step away from that and to manage um, cognitive load uh, and to build new habits of mind. And to build new habits of mind, you need to practice those new habits of mind over a period of time. So the whole coaching process allows you to build these new habits these new ways of thinking through the work that you do with your coaching partner through that constant reflection uh and and practicing things in the classroom practicing ways of, of, of thinking so i think that just to answer your question very directly how can coaching transform cpd it can transform it by making cpd an experience that is um that is personalised. It's a it's a personalised form of continuing professional development. Yeah. I don't where I didn't actually say what the acronym stood for. CPD, continuing professional development. It's a way of saying that everybody is different. Everybody has different situations and different things that they would like to focus on, need to focus on, uh, and coaching provides that platform. So it's moving away from that generic approach to continuing professional professional development uh, and to a more personalised approach. And it's the apply bit of Kolb's learning cycle, isn't it? It's about, yes. about enabling people to apply ap application. It's interesting because um, we first went into the NHS in 2003 when coaching wasn't really known. Yeah. Because their head of learning and development had had a conversation with somebody who'd had coaching with me, actually, and said um, they were just chatting and the head of L&D said, people are going on courses and it's not making any difference. Mm -hmm. And this, this mutual person said, oh, do you know anything about coaching? And she said, no. <laughs> um, and that was the beginning of our work at the NHS, which, and yeah. now we work nationally, which is very exciting. But, you know, all thanks to that coffee in yeah. 2003. And that's sometimes the way it starts, isn't it? And, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, if you're just looking at it from, from a very sort of pragmatic angle, uh, and and schools wanting to get value for money in terms of investment in professional development, then you know, then then there's all sorts of um, research out there that that suggests that you know it's a much better use of limited resource, limited yeah. financial resource to focus on on coaching and providing time uh, for training and also for the coaching to happen than it is to invest on an ongoing basis on you know sometimes some very sort of expensive courses. And I'm not I'm not belittling. 
um you know the workshops courses etc you know they're, they're really good and I th- in fact i'd say they're a vital part of the equation because you need something to actually um to to focus in on in your coaching conversations and they can provide a you know rich source of content to discuss and think about and as i said if you can distill out the stuff that really matters for you then that that's where the impact can be generated so what's your wildest dream about this book then duncan <laughs> um I, I haven't dared to dream very much but now you've asked me the question um i i um I'm, I'm keen that it um is read in lots of different school contexts largely because of the fact that my career has taken me into lots of different cultural contexts um and, and different school contexts so when i was writing it um i i was trying not to have a particular sort of education system or country in mind I, I wanted to make this something that would speak to teachers in all sorts of different different settings um so um i i I'm, that's i think one dream i have for it the other thing is that and i i wanted to write a book that that was concise uh and one that um provided um some clarity for for people that are reading it because one of the um one of the facts about um, how coaching is perceived within the school world at the moment is that um, there is a lot of um, confusion about what coaching is and what coaching isn't. And that often happens within any setting, but definitely within the school setting when sort of something new comes in uh, and people kind of uh, latch onto it. Um, that there's a danger that people don't quite understand the nuances and don't understand what it really is. So one of the things that I try to do in the book is I try to help people understand the difference between coaching and mentoring, for example, but also the difference between coaching, um, what I call coaching for teachers and coaching for leaders, coaching for teachers being more focused on classroom practice, but leadership coaching doesn't only have to be for leaders in formal leader leadership positions, but, a different type of coaching experience that allows people to think about how they interact with their colleagues and how they impact on their colleagues and and just a way of people being understand being able to understand the language because one of the things that I've experienced and certainly research shows is that um, one of the most powerful um, drivers for change within a school setting is people um, having a shared language, a common vocabulary for talking about what they're seeking to achieve and that people are able to sort of come together under this shared understanding and make reference to this, 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 uh, this common vocabulary in such a way that sort of drives things forward. Um, and, um, you know, there are all sorts of examples of how that can be a really, really powerful way of, of bringing about necessary change in the school. Um, uh, and on the opposite end of that spectrum is that sometimes, again, because schools are, are very busy places, there's there's too much change and there's too much kind of vocabulary and there's too much um um there's too too many terms for people to get their heads around and what people then tend to do is just kind of pull the shutters down and disappear um metaphorically and, and i suppose in reality into their classrooms and 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 not want to engage more widely yeah. than that and say you know i'll just pay lip service to this stuff that's happening and nod my head and hope it goes away rather than uh creating a situation where where people are excited by what is being proposed by the school in order to drive things forward um so i'm hoping that 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 the book is accessible enough and concise enough for people to be able to uh read it not just individually but sort of on you know, in schools as well and you know i've worked with schools who've sort of bought numerous copies uh for their staff for, for their professional library with the idea being that everybody sort of reads it um because it gives a sort of a, a starting point for talking about um, you know, what the school is seeking to achieve. I was in a school in India last week uh, and I worked with um, about 50 percent of the of the team in the, in the school who were interested in, in coaching and what coaching could could do to help them um, achieve their their individual, but also school aspirations. And um, it was the, the sense of sort of tangible excitement at the end of um the two days that i spent with them was was great because basically um you had a group of people who came away with a kind of common experience and a, a and a common goal to try and work together to embed a culture of coaching across the school um and you know when you've got 50 percent of the school who are 
positioning themselves as coaching champions, uh, uh, so to speak. You know, they're putting themselves in a very good position to work with and help other colleagues understand and buy into it. And and I suppose, you know, that that sort of encapsulated what I hope the book um, might be able to do in, in other school settings. Great. Thank you. So how do people get in touch with you, Duncan, if they want to talk? So uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm an avid user of Twitter. I, I think that it's the... Um, um, a fantastic uh, platform for for learning and learning from people. Obviously, you have to treat it with caution and care, and there's quite a lot of toxicity that 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 that, that um, Twitter can can generate. But as long as you manage to sort of steer away from that, so my my Twitter handle is at um, Educe, which is the name of my coaching company. Educe is the Latin word um, for to draw out. Interestingly, um, um, so at Educe E D U C E underscore coaching so that's my twitter okay. account um my my website is um educe m for mentoring c for coaching.com so people can okay have a brilliant also, also a, a link to the um to the book there and you can you can get a discount on the book as well if you on the link there thank you very much so your book is uh, coaching for educators how to transform cpd in your school and duncan partridge thank you for coming to the coaching in lovely thank you very much i really enjoyed it bye-bye bye-bye if you've enjoyed what you've heard today we'd love you to share the podcast with a friend or leave a comment on social media and if you'd like to become a regular at the coaching in you can subscribe on podbean and all major podcast channels we look forward to welcoming you next time You've been listening to The Coaching In, 3D Coaching's virtual pub. For more information, check out 3dcoaching.com.